Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Future of Energy, a monthly series presented by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Institute for Science and Policy. I'm Trent Noss, Managing Editor at the Institute, and we're so glad to have you with us today. Uh, we love to hear everywhere you're watching from, and it's so great to see so many different cities and uh, represented from around the state and even internationally tonight. So thank you for, for uh, tuning in. We're going to be talking about the grid today and specifically some of the latest innovations around optimization that are pointing the way toward a more efficient and more resilient electricity infrastructure. Historically and really throughout much of the last century, the grid was mostly set up to be a one-way distribution with the big regional power plants generating energy and sending it to the customers. And that was pretty much that. Your bill came in the mail at the end of the month. But obviously that architecture is changing dramatically. Homes and businesses are increasingly integrating their own renewable energy sources and storage, whether that's rooftop solar or plug-in electric vehicles. And that's creating more of a two-way street, more of a dynamic energy market. So this newer, more distributed model comes with some challenges for utilities who now have to manage that back and forth energy flow at scale. And that requires some creativity and some innovation. The, the grid is adapting as well. And this drive toward optimization is spurring research into things like machine learning, autonomous systems, and advanced algorithms that can move more efficiently, uh, match energy supply and demand throughout these complex networks. And this is happening at the state and federal level, as well as in the private sector. So we're gonna get into all that and we'll hear about what's known as the duck curve. We'll talk about smart grids, microgrids, and everything in between with our two outstanding guests tonight. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Brian Hannigan. He's the president and CEO of Holy Cross Energy, which is a not-for-profit member-owned electric cooperative utility providing energy services to more than 42,000 customers in Western Colorado. Prior to joining Holy Cross, Brian was an Associate Laboratory Director at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where he co-founded the U.S. Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Initiative and started up the Energy Systems Integration Facility, which is a unique distribution grid in a box, enabling utilities, entrepreneurs, and consumers to work together on cleaner, more affordable and more reliable energy systems. And er, earlier in his career, Brian held senior leadership roles at the Electric Power Research Institute, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Trent. And uh, welcome to now, I see 136 participants on with us this afternoon. So great, welcome to everybody. Yeah, terrific, should be a great discussion. Uh, we're also happy to be joined by Kyrie Baker, an assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Architectural Engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. And she also holds a joint appointment at NREL through the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute. Previously, Dr. Baker was a research engineer in the Power Systems Engineering Center at NREL and received her PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. Her work focuses on advanced controls and optimization methods that can help integrate renewables, facilitate building to grid interactions, and foster efficient operation of smart grids and smart cities. Kyrie, welcome. Thank you, Trent. Um, happy to be here and looking forward to any questions the audience might have. Great. Yes, thank you. That's a great reminder. Uh, this, this discussion is intended to be interactive. So, please do keep those questions coming in through the chat and we'll have some moderated discussion at the end and we'll try to get to as many as we're able to. Um, Kyrie is gonna kick off our discussion today with an overview of her group's research into grid optimization. So uh, Kyrie, take it away. All right, thank you. So I just wanted to give a brief overview Trent already did a good job of introducing me, so I won't do that anymore. Um, but my background is in renewable energy integration from the perspective of grid optimization. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the grid, I thought I'd give a couple minutes introduction. So the grid is comprised of a lot of components. It's a very, very complex system. Um, in fact, it's so complex that the National Academy of Engineers ranks electric power as the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. So this is 
a bigger achievement than you know cars airplanes internet all these things require electricity so if we take a look at the way the grid traditionally operated we have these large scale power plants that trent was talking about we have transformers which are devices that change the voltage levels we have long power lines we have transmission towers we have distribution towers and ultimately eventually the electricity reaches you so how is this changing with what's called the smart grid so smart grid is a term that people throw around and even people in my field can't agree on a standard definition for smart grid but you can think of it just as a basic more intelligent more clean electric power grid so one distinguishing feature is distributed energy resources so these are things like solar batteries um, potentially small wind turbines, electric vehicles. And we have generation now that's close to or co-located with demand. So this is a lot different than the way the grid used to work with this downstream effect flowing from transmission to load. We now have generation on the buildings themselves. So this is not how the grid was built. The grid was not designed for generation to be here. So we're struggling to accommodate all this uh, solar in many areas. Another key feature of smart grids are that there's generally cleaner. We want to have more sustainable energy systems. We want them to be more modular. You might have heard of microgrids or nanogrids or even picogrids if you want to be fancy. And these are just really small self-enclosed portions of the grid. And then the last part, and what traditionally makes this smart rather than just you know, a renewable grid, is there's more communication, there's more visibility into what's going on, there's more sensors. So here's an outage map of Excel that I got this morning of the Denver Boulder area. And you can see that there's a bunch of outages that either people have manually reported to Excel or that Excel has automatically determined based on smart electricity meters. So in some areas of the country, it's now being required that buildings need to have what's called smart meters. So your electricity meter remotely communicates with the utility about your energy consumption. Prior to that, it was somebody who physically came out in a truck and then looked at your electricity meter every month and wrote down the consumption. So that's the previous grid. Smart grid is automatic outage detection. And this can really help pinpoint where outages are and prevent you from going hours and hours or maybe even days with outages by helping the utility know where to look. So the reason the grid is such a hot topic these days is because some of you, um, especially if you're in California, are very familiar with forced power outages, power outages due to wildfires, power outages due to increased demand, perhaps due to uncertainty in renewable energy. And there's a lot of different threats that center around natural disasters, hazards, increased temperatures, causing people to use more electricity, equipment aging. Our grid is just getting really, really old. Some of the transformers and uh, transmission lines are extremely old. Um, they need to be replaced. And this is making it even more challenging to deliver electricity to consumers. There's also effects that we haven't really considered before when designing the grid. We thought about, oh yeah, there's, we, there might be a heat wave. There might be a windstorm, there might be a hurricane, but the pandemic was something that nobody foresaw, especially in the, in the ways that it's impacted the grid. So this was just three days I pulled from New York City, and you can see in 2019, the general demand in New York City, the electricity demand looks something like this. We have this peak, people get up in the morning, they go to work, they come home, then they go to sleep. In 2019, it looked like this. In 2020, the demand has gone down because all these businesses shut down. People aren't working in office buildings. Everybody's at home. And this drop is about equivalent to about 20%, which is 1,000 megawatts. And to give you a rough idea of how much 1,000 megawatts is, that's all of the solar power installed in Colorado. So that's a significant um, demand change. So you might be thinking, oh, this is a positive thing. Um, you know, people are using less electricity, but it also goes both ways. And this was in April, but in August, New York City also experienced some spikes in electricity demand because everybody was staying at home, blasting their air conditioners during a heat wave. And it was really, really hard for the grid to keep up. Okay, as Trent promised you, and if any of my students are listening to this, they're gonna be like, oh, Dr. Baker's talking about the duck curve again. But this is a really illustrative example of how renewable energy can actually make it more difficult for the grid. 
So here's California. This is not all of California. It's within a certain region called CAISO, California Independent System Operator. We have, this is a day in February. We have this general shape. Again, people get up. There's a peak when people are turning on electric kettles, they're turning on TVs, they're doing all this stuff in the morning, taking showers. They go to work. They go to more efficient commercial buildings. So there's more people packed into smaller spaces. So we get this dip in the middle of the day. And then they come home and we have another peak when people are cooking, turning on lights, all this stuff. If we subtract the amount of solar generation and wind generation in California, in the Kaiso region, we get this curve that sort of looks like this purple line. This is the net demand. At night, there's very little solar or there's very little wind, there's no solar. And then during the middle of the day, as the sun rises, we get this um, drop in net demand. And as, as the sun sets, we get this uh, spike in net demand. And so these ramps and spikes are due to, um, are, are what the conventional power plants like hydro fossil fuel plants have to make up. So why is this bad? This is the duck curve. This is bad because it's really, really challenging for these traditional thermoelectric power plants to ramp down really quickly for a few hours and then ramp back up. Some of them, because this is such a dramatic amount of solar in California, may have to even shut off for a few hours. And a power plant like, let's take nuclear as an extreme example, takes multiple days to shut down or turn back on. You can't just turn off entire power plants for a few hours and turn them back on. So it's really challenging for grids to take into account the renewable variability, but also the amount of renewables because of the ramps, because of the uncertainty, and because there's a sudden dip in the middle of the day with um, what these power plants have to make up. Under COVID, what does this look like? So this was in April. You can generally see that it's much flatter. The demand is flattening. You may have heard the term um, weekdays now look more like weekends. If we subtract the solar from this to determine and the wind from this to determine what the conventional power plants now have to make up, we see a smaller ramp. We see a flatter duck belly in the middle of the day. So it's a little bit easier for the conventional power plants to deal with. So looking at both of these, this was before the stay at home orders, this was after generally decreased load, not as much solar um, curtailment, which is wasting more utilization of solar, less ramping. Okay, what is this doing to electricity prices? So the way that pricing works depends on where you live in the US, but in areas with competitive wholesale electricity markets, this means that there's less power plants being on because people are consuming less electricity. So there's a lot of these generating companies making less money. So this is kind of suppressing the prices. And looking at this in New York City, for example, so the way you can read these plots is this axis is just five minute intervals. The, the Z axis here is the cost of electricity. And then here is what day we're looking at. So in 2019, here's the cost of electricity in New York City. Um, and again, this is at the wholesale level, not the retail price that you as a residential consumer would pay, but what the big guys are making um, and paying for. And we see that it has a lot of spikes. The electricity price, price gets up to $374, which is very expensive. When we move into the stay at home orders, when there's less gas peaker plants on, when there's less expensive power plants on that need to um, account for those huge electricity peaks, the biggest spike we see is $186 per megawatt hour. So about half or less than half um, of what we see in normal times in New York. And in fact, there's so much energy from renewable energy that electricity prices are going negative. This is one of the few markets where you'll actually see people pay you to use more electricity. And that's because it's more expensive to shut off those power plants than it is to keep them on. We want to keep on that gas power plant. We want to keep on that coal plant because shutting them down and then starting it back up is expensive. It's challenging. It's sometimes technically not possible in a few hours. So it, generally we're seeing um, much, much lower prices and in some cases negative prices. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. And the takeaway I want to focus on, which is what my lab focuses on, is how can we change the way the grid operates? How can we use our existing sources and our existing assets to help integrate renewable sources, help avoid some of these problems like the duck curve? 
And so one big aspect of that is the duck curve happens because of the way we use electricity. We're used to coming home, turning on all of the things and doing whatever we want, not thinking about how when I run my dishwasher, it's impacting something upstream. And so one thing my, my lab does is we work on techniques such as um, load shifting and peak shaving to change when people use their appliances. So in Excel, which is um, the utility that services a lot of the areas where probably a lot of you are from, 2 to 6 p.m., really expensive to run appliances because that's when all those peaker plants are running. That's when it's hard for Excel to deliver electricity to you. The losses in the grid are high. Um, the, the power plants are struggling. So they incentivize you to shift when you use electricity to off hours. So this is in the middle of the night. Now, most people aren't going to completely change their behavior and start taking showers, running dishwashers, washing clothes in the middle of the night. So what my lab tries to do is create algorithms that automatically choose when to heat or cool your house and, and try to do so such that you as a homeowner don't even notice what's going on. As long as your house is cool, you don't really care. And so we try to shift that cooling energy to the middle of the day to overlap with solar, for example. And there's a lot of things in here that we can optimize. I'm not going to go over everything because I'm probably already over my 12 minutes of time. Um, but my group focuses on operational techniques, specifically with regards to how buildings in the grid can interact. Okay, and that's all I had. Great. Well, thank you, Kyrie. I appreciate that uh, overview there. And I'm sure there's a lot more to dive into in Q&A. Um, Brian, you're going to tell us about some of the innovative work that Holy Cross has done. Yeah, thanks, Trent. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining again. Um, I think Kyrie's done an excellent job of laying down the foundation for uh, how the grid is changing from an engineering standpoint. I want to share a little bit of perspective on how we see the, the grid changing from a business and a consumer standpoint. In other words, what is all this technology that's coming onto the grid? What does that really mean for you, the consumer? And, and how is that likely to change some of the ways in which we as utilities interact with you uh, going forward. So a, a little bit about Holy Cross Energy. We're one of 22 rural electric cooperatives here in the state of Colorado. Holy Cross is actually based in Glenwood Springs. So we're a couple hours west of Denver on the I-70 corridor. Um, we serve the Roaring Fork Valley, the Eagle Vale Valley, a little bit of the Colorado River Valley on the way to Grand Junction. So if you get out west of the divide, uh, chances are you're in our service territory. Um, last year in 2019, uh, we served 44% of our power supply from renewable and non-carbon emitting energy resources. Um, when you add in the voluntary renewable and clean power purchases from our members, that number came up to 47%. Uh, so we're well on the way to, as our vision statement here states, leading the responsible transition to a clean energy future. In fact, in the middle of 2000, let me get over to the screen here, there we go. In the middle of 2018, we announced something called our 70-70-30 plan. We were one of the first utilities in the state to make a commitment to substantially increase the amount of clean energy we were gonna be putting on our system, um, reducing our dependence on coal-fired generation, which has traditionally been one of the mainstays of the Colorado energy supply, increasing our purchase of renewables, wind and solar energy from the Eastern Plains, as well as investing in new local renewable energy resources here in our own community. Um, in the next couple of years, you'll see a uh, solar energy farm on final approach to the Aspen Airport. Uh, it's really hard to site and permit new things in Aspen. Uh, land is not cheap. Uh, but we made a commitment on behalf of our community to bring clean energy into the neighborhood with a project that's directly connected uh, to, our pro to our system. Uh, and most importantly, we're going to improve the energy efficiency of our network and also the buildings and the vehicles and the businesses that are connected to it. So we're well on a path to take that 44% number up to 70% or even more and to do it in a way which doesn't increase the cost of our power supply which is about half of what you pay on an electric bill. So getting the electricity from the markets that Kyrie pointed out, from the generation resources, that's about half of your bill for a typical utility. The other half of your bill comes in the delivery charges. 
How do we get it from the power plant through the high voltage transmission network, which you can think of as kind of the interstate highway system uh, of the electric grid, and then through the distribution network, which is a medium to low voltage network, think county roads, think the side streets, all the way to the primary wire that goes from the pole outside your house to the, to the panel on your home or your business, uh, that's your driveway, right? And so we think of the electric grid in, in kind of that same way that we think of the, the road infrastructure. Um, and that's the other half of what goes on to your bill. In fact, as we see the architecture of the grid changing over time, more and more that interstate highway system, that transmission system, is going to be governed and operated by what we call regional transmission operators or independent system operators that exist in various states around the country. They don't exist in Colorado yet, but there'll be a big debate this year in the legislature and at the Public Utility Commission about whether that kind of independent transmission operator should function for the benefit of the state to provide equal access to that highway system for all utilities. Holy Cross and other electric cooperatives, as well as an XL Energy or a Black Hills, um, they provide distribution services. So again, those side roads, those county roads. Um, and we typically are moving more towards what we call a distribution system operator role, where we have basically one job, and that's to keep your lights on. Right to deliver the power from the high voltage network directly to your home. And increasingly, as Kyrie pointed out, we're accommodating not only power flow coming from this transmission system, as you see here on the slide, but also directly from our consumers themselves through your rooftop solar systems or the batteries that are in your garage or the backup generators that provide you with resilient power supply if our grid supply goes out. As I mentioned, we're also connecting wind and solar projects directly into the distribution system. So to the side roads, to the county roads, and not always to the interstate highway. And then when you have collections of these resources that can function as their own islands, we see communities investing in things called microgrids that can help that community stay afloat even when the broader grid isn't available to them. So we began to experiment a couple of years ago with this concept of a microgrid in something called our Basalt Vista Affordable Housing Project. This is in the town of Basalt, which is in the Roaring Fork Valley, an area that we serve. It started as an affordable housing project to provide uh, affordable places to live for teachers and service economy workers and others in our community that frankly couldn't afford to live in the places where they work. So the school district donated the land, the county donated the improvements, Habitat for Humanity, our local chapter, donated the labor and the materials. And those uh, stakeholders turned to us and said, hey, can you help us pioneer affordable housing that is not only affordable, but it's also sustainable. It's entirely powered by renewable energy resources. It doesn't have a natural gas hookup. And so we provided a number of resources that are on uh, each of the first four homes at this project, a rooftop solar system, a battery storage, uh, one in each basement, if you will, a level two electric vehicle charger so that we could bring clean electricity into mobility and offset some of the gasoline demand for these families as well, a heat pump water heater and an air source heat pump to provide comfort and clean hot water so basically all the resources that you would need to live in these homes, and you can, you can see the picture here, these resources were individually controllable. So when Kyrie talks about investing in demand flexibility and being able to absorb extra power during times of surplus or being able to actually contribute power during times of shortage, we put these devices from the lab where she was working at the time into the field in these four homes where these teachers and their families were living and we put them through their paces, right? We operated the houses on their own. We operated the houses in providing power mode as a power plant would to our system. We operated the houses in absorbing extra wind and solar when we had it and would have had to have paid to curtail it and send it away to someplace else. So it really allowed us to look at these consumer owned resources as ways to build resilience and actually operate our grid more efficiently. Um, 
what that allows us to do is rethink the way that we interact with our consumer. When Trent opened up with his remarks, he said, you know, look, the, the grid used to be very passive, one way power from big power plant to passive consumer, and you got told what you had to pay at the end of the month with your bill. We see the electric grid of the future as being much more dynamic and interactive than that. In fact, we have consumers now that are signed up to a peak time rebate program where we send them a note on their text message or on their email and we say, hey, this afternoon, we'll pay you not to consume during the time where we're at that peak part of our duck curve uh, that Kyrie showed. And it'll actually save us more money than we'll pay you, but everybody wins in this scenario because we're using the grid more efficiently. Conversely, if we have too much wind or too much solar, here's a great opportunity to charge up your vehicle or power your battery or run that dishwasher or load up your hot water at an extremely affordable, if not free, rate that helps you help us, again, run the system more efficiently. Um, we can also help finance and install and pay for the costs of installing these distributed energy resources, provided that you allow us to use them to offset other investments we might have to make in bigger poles, bigger wires, bigger distribution equipment that frankly we don't need to make except for a couple of hours a day or a couple of hours out of the year. You know, in the utility space, there's an adage that, that we try to say, um, we don't want to build the church only for the Sunday crowd, right? We don't want to build and overbuild the capacity when it's never used. We want to try to use that capacity consistently throughout the year. And we see these distributed energy resources as a, a way to help us do that, provided that we can use the data, the machine learning, the artificial intelligence. We can actually predict when we're going to have too much or too little energy because we're now predicting the wind and the sun that drive those generation resources. So it's a very exciting future and one that is, I think, just rife with a lot of value for you as consumers, um, ways that we can empower you to actually manage your energy costs. Because for many of us, energy costs are the biggest uh, part of our disposable income. And wouldn't it be great to just flatten those out put them on auto pay, forget about it, so that we can go ahead and live the rest of our lives and get out recreating or take care of our families and our loved ones. Because after all, those are the really important things and the reason why we live in this great place like Colorado. So um, I just thank everybody for being involved. Get excited. And if you're not hearing about these things from your utility, start asking for them because it'll be your consumer demand that drives their innovation. And unless you do it, it's not going to happen. Great. Well, thank you, Brian. That's uh, um, just an incredible web of, of innovation. And uh, thank you for your work on this, on this program. It's certainly an exciting future, as you say. Um, we've got a lot of great questions coming in through the chat. I'm going to try to work through uh, some of these. And one of the first ones that I wanted to pose to both of you, maybe maybe Kyrie, you can start, is the question of retrofitting existing or particularly older structures with some of these innovations. Uh, maybe you've got a building that is you know, really not uh, up to snuff and, and doesn't have any of these features, or maybe it's an entire uh, neighborhood. And the, the thought might be, it's gonna be too costly. It's gonna be too complicated. Um, can you speak to the, some of the challenges and opportunities about integrating some of these new technologies? Yeah, so when you hear the term smart house, you probably think of, you know, if you've gone to Best Buy, they now have ovens that are somehow Wi-Fi connected. And you don't need to have a Wi-Fi connected oven to participate in a lot of these programs. In fact, probably a lot of your utilities might actually um, incentivize you. Some offer discounted Nest thermostats or even free Nest thermostats. Some offer programs to upgrade or to help you upgrade devices in your house to be more energy efficient. So I'd say the simplest and the easiest way you can make your house grid interactive is through a smart thermostat. So if you have electric heating or cooling, um, central heating or cooling and you buy a Nest or you buy an Ecobee or something that has communication capabilities, that can generally interface with your utility directly and something like Nest's rush hour rewards program automatically shifts when you heat or cool your house based on prices. 
Um, so you don't need to have a lot of um, fancy devices, but something just like a thermostat could change your bill and uh, help the grid. Brian, how about you? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is integrating all of these new resources in a way that allows us to communicate with them as utility operators, um, but it also allows the devices to communicate amongst themselves. One of the innovative features of our Basalt Vista project and some work that Kyrie and her collaborators at the, at the lab actually helped us with was the use of a controller for each of these devices that, uh, that sensed what was going on with the grid and actually instructed the distributed energy resource to behave in a way that was compatible not only with what the grid needed, but what all the other devices at that same home were doing. Um, I liken it a little bit to when you go to an orchestra and you listen to all the instruments, the music that you hear is the sum total of the coordination, the orchestration of all those instruments. If you could imagine that same orchestra where each one of them were playing off a different song sheet, it wouldn't sound very good. And all of these devices, if they're just behaving on their own construct, uh, instructions, they actually can start to compete against one another and create more problems for themselves and for the grid. So this ability to have what we call interoperability for these devices to, to interoperate with one another and to be orchestrated by either a utility or a third party that can do that on behalf of the utility or the consumer. I think that's the, the linchpin and we're just really excited to have demonstrated it at least once with our Basalt Vista project. And we're now actively thinking, okay, how do we take it from four houses to 44,000 in our entire service territory? Let's stick with that question of scale for a moment. Uh, in terms of the interplay between energy policy that's set at a state level or a federal level versus the innovation that's bubbling up from the labs, um, can you speak to the, the best meshing of those two things? Is it, is it the technology comes first and then the policy sort of adapts or the policy comes in and sets the marker and then technology catches up? What do you, what do you think? You know, that's a, a super great question, Trent, because I've worked on both sides of that divide. As you, you mentioned in my, my background, I, I started with policy and then I migrated to technology and now sort of work at the interface of both. I think policy can definitely pull technology along, but only if the policy is focused on the outcome. Too often what we see are policies that are trying, that are a, attempting to write things too prescriptively for one interest or another, right? Use this particular type of chemistry on a battery versus make the, make the rules more open for any kind of battery technology, right? So we don't want um, a policy that is so specific that the technology has a very hard time of actually achieving the policy goals. So, so broad is better. On the other hand, with projects like ours at Basalt Vista, We've now fostered a discussion at the Colorado legislature about, well, how do we change the policy to allow more of these kinds of projects to come forward? Because we see there are values for doing so. Maybe our policies aren't set up to reward them the way that they could be rewarded. And now that we see that the technology actually works, we can go and have a cogent conversation about how the policy should be shaped so that we can scale it up. So I actually think it goes both ways, depending on where the technology is in its maturity level. If it's much closer to the market, then I think it drives. But if it's early on, I think the policy can pull it along by saying, this is what we need in order to meet that policy goal. Yeah, and towards what Brian said, I would like to emphasize that it's so important to have both engineers and policymakers talking constantly because there often is a disconnect um, between those two where engineers aren't looking at practical problems that can be implemented potentially because we're too much in our research world. Policymakers aren't familiar with the actual physical constraints of the grid. You can't just install a bunch of renewables and say you have 100% sustainable grid. It's a lot more complicated than that, unfortunately. Very true, very true. Um, in terms of stakeholder engagement and consumer education about some of these new technologies, some of these new innovations, have, have 
either of you found anything to be particularly helpful or particularly effective when it comes to letting folks know that these these programs are out there, they're available, they're happening, uh, the, the future is here. Um, can you talk a little bit about bringing people into the, into the fold? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really challenging and important area. And I think especially webinars like this are so important because a lot of people don't even realize, um, you know, how the grid works and what, how fragile it is to some degree. Um, I saw a survey done where they asked people, what do you think the biggest energy consum consuming appliances in your house? And most people said the, re the refrigerator. So I think a lot of education towards um, helping consumers understand what their electricity bill is made of, you know, until Brian said 50% of that is delivery and 50% is actually the power. Um, probably a lot of people aren't familiar with what those charges are, what their money's going to, um, and how they can participate to not only help themselves, but also help the broader system. Um, so education is just so important. You know, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, see it, touch it, right? Uh, one of the reasons why we pushed forward with the Basalt Vista project was so that we could bring Governor Polis, we could bring the legislative leaders, we could bring other utility executives, we could bring uh, members of the public. Uh, Habitat for Humanity uses it to inspire um, energy efficiency and net zero construction in its projects around the country. I think until you actually see it the first time and walk through it and talk to the people who are living there and no, it's not always going dark. Yes, our bill is only $12 a month. It's the most amazing thing. Until you see it in the real world for the first time, it's always like this mythical creature, like, oh my gosh, someday there's gonna be this thing. And then you see it, you're like, it's really there. Um, and I think that inspires folks both from an innovator standpoint, because now you, you get excited and you wanna do the next best thing on it, but it also inspires consumers to say, well, I've seen it once, why can't they give it to me, right? And that's the kind of pressure that I think creates fertile ground for innovation because there's now a market for that, right? Um, there's now an opportunity for a business to succeed. We are doing this because we think this is how the world's gonna be. And we know that our communities and our consumers are asking us for this stuff. So either we provide it to them or somebody else does. And, and I know which side I'd like to be on. Well, you mentioned myth mythical creatures, and uh, speaking of that, the uh, the holy grail for a long time has been grid level storage for renewables, right? A giant battery that we could that we could attach to the grid and, and hold on to all that solar and hold on to the wind so that we can use it when we want it. Is optimization in the in the sense that both of you are talking about? Does that somewhat mitigate the need for huge levels of storage because we're able to just have We've got a lot of energy on the system and we can sort of move it where we need, need it to be, or is there still a pretty high need for some kind of a grid level storage breakthrough? Yeah, this is a question that I get a lot, especially from my students when I talk about duck curve or when I talk about shifting demand, they're like, batteries solve all of these problems. Why do we need to change when we run our dishwashers? Why don't we just put a bunch of batteries? And I think right now, I mean, if you look at the cost of energy storage, the unsubsidized cost, it's really prohibitive for most consumers. The lifespan of these batteries is also generally shorter than we'd like, maybe, maybe 10 years, you know, being generous in some cases. Um, also, we don't always think about the life cycle effects of constructing a battery or disposing of those batteries, and those have high environmental costs. Mining lithium isn't always environmentally safe disposing of the battery isn't always environmentally safe. And so there's a lot of externalities that come into play with energy storage. That said, I don't think that demand shifting or having consumers change the way they use electricity is going to be the sole solution for um, getting to 100% renewables. Storage is gonna play a huge part in that, both small scale storage and utility scale storage, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, and we produce, so much solar during the midday, and we produce in Colorado, particularly on the Eastern Plains, so much wind in the overnight hours um, that you're talking about moving around hundreds of megawatts, potentially thousands of megawatts. And you would have to 
lay down containers of container sized shipping containers of batteries, you know, over massive amounts of area and, and use them, you know, once a day to try to move those things around. And while I, I certainly it's engineeringly possible, um, it, it's a very blunt instrument. There are some other opportunities with demand flexibility, with shifting uh, the way that we use power with taking some of that extra renewable energy and using it to crack water open, uh, separate it into hydrogen and oxygen, use the hydrogen and store it, which you can do in a much more dense way, run that back through a fuel cell later on, or use it with captured CO2 from the atmosphere to help climate change. You can create a fully renewable version of natural gas that you can store in the same places that we store natural gas now. One of the bigger challenges that I see for energy storage is not, can we move it five minutes or can we move the power five hours? It's, can we move it from the summer when it's sunny to the winter where it's typically not and the heating loads are much, much greater. It's that seasonal storage for long periods of time, large amounts, gigawatts over days. Um, this is the challenge that we're all facing, whether it's California or Colorado, and there we look at pump storage hydro, we looked at compressed air, we look at that renewable natural gas. Um, there's, there's a variety of scales for which storage is appropriate. And as I wrote in the chat, we're gonna need all of them, all shapes, all sizes. Um, we're seeing battery storage with some of the projects that we're doing today that'll come online in the next two to three years, and that's great, but that's only this much of the challenge that we're gonna face as we go all the way to 100%. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, we're getting close on our time here, but uh, I wanted to wrap up by asking each of you to give me a, a little bit of a bold prediction or maybe a, an, an, optimist, uh, an optimistic case of what we can maybe look forward to here in the next few years. What's something that is on your mind that, uh, that you're excited about? Um, we'll go to Brian first and then Kyrie can have the last word. So I've got two, I've got a little bit of inside knowledge. Um, one is don't be surprised if you see um, a utility actually uh, meet a 100% clean energy target within the next three to five years. I, I think it's completely doable and confidentially, I'm planning to do it here, okay? <laughs> um, so that's one. And then the second is you all have heard of the self-driving car. Um, I think we're going to have in very short order a self-driving electric grid. The reason being is that with all of the sensors and all of the data and all of the computational power that we have, um, we can actually create that orchestration, that sheet music for all of these devices so that they can read and react to one another in a way which will largely be free, in my view, of human intervention except when something goes really, really wrong. You'll still need an electric grid operator but that electric grid operator will more be monitoring things and handling the extremes rather than doing a lot of the, you know, oops, something's out, we got to roll the truck. Um, I, I think you're going to see things self-driving and it'll be so transparent to you as a consumer, you'll hardly even notice. Perfect. Yeah, mine is similar to that. <laughs> I think the biggest, the biggest trend I see is um, self-healing grids, modular grids, the ability to have higher levels of resiliency to hazards. We're going to experience hotter and hotter summers. We're going to experience more windstorms, whether we like it or not. And so having these grids less reliant on, you know, 70 miles of power line um, is really important, especially for rural areas in Colorado. I think I saw that somebody um, is under the Mountain Parks Electric Co-op. We're working with them, one of my master's students, to look at a really, really rural area of their system and see how could this benefit from a microgrid. So more autonomy, self-healing, more modular grids. Hopefully these algorithms and these um, controllers can help us maintain the frequency, voltage, and power supply to keep the consumers happy and to keep them with a reliable source of electricity. Terrific. Well, what a great note to, uh, to end this conversation on. I'm, uh, I, I want to thank you both for your time today, for lending us your, your insights and experience. And uh, 
Yeah, this was this was fun. I, I think uh, I think we had a great discussion here. So thank you to you both. Um, I want to thank my museum colleagues for helping us put on this session today, and to our audience for all the terrific engagement. I'm so I'm so sorry we can't ever get to all the questions. Uh, if you do have additional questions, you can send them to us at institute at dmns.org, and we can forward them along to the panelists and uh, and maybe get you. A little bit of insight there. Um, we are continuing this series on a monthly basis. Our next session is going to be Tuesday, November 17th at the same time, 4 p.m. Mountain. And so the best way to uh, stay up to date with all of our upcoming programming is to go to our website, institute.dmns.org. You can sign up for our newsletter, find us on social. A recording of this session will be available on our YouTube page within about 24 hours if you'd like to revisit anything that we talked about today or, uh, or share it with a friend. So thank you again for joining us today and uh, we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.